Cairo, Seattle. Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, a show about famous people and the stories behind the foods they love most. Today on the program, Christina Tosi. Christina is the founder, CEO, and James Beard Award winning chef of Milk Bar, a much beloved bakery with locations in six cities, including New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas. She's written four whimsical cookbooks and been a judge on MasterChef, MasterChef Junior, and the new Netflix show, Bake Squad. She also has a new adorable children's book called Every Cake Has a Story. Christina is known for her multi-tiered, fun fetty style naked birthday cakes, topped with crunchy birthday crumbs and rainbow sprinkles. But Christina is an equal opportunity cake lover. Can you get down with just a grocery store sheet cake? Oh, gr- don't even get me started. I mean, that for me is like where I loved cake. The way that I eat a grocery store sheet cake, I literally spoon frosting. I scrape that cake clean. I think the in-store bakeries and grocery stores are a pretty marvelous place to be. Thanks to Christina, this is our birthday cake episode. We'll learn the history of the birthday cake and why we light birthday candles with Elisa Levine, author of Cake, A Slice of History. And Anne Byrne will tell us why cakes became the celebration food. She is a cake historian and cookbook author. Her brand new book is called A New Take on Cake. But first, my conversation with Christina Tosi. Christina is famous for taking sentimental childhood flavors and suburban grocery store pantry favorites and spinning them into fun new dessert creations. The whimsy, joy, enthusiasm, and silliness she has for life definitely shines through in her desserts. She created Milk Bar cereal milk ice cream, compost cookies that are studded with pretzels, potato chips, graham crackers, coffee, oats, and butterscotch, and the super popular Milk Bar Pie. The pie was created out of necessity many years ago when it was her turn to make staff meal at a restaurant and there was hardly anything in the fridge. Christina is also a badass businesswoman, which kind of makes sense considering her original career trajectory. So you actually went to school for first mechanical engineering and then math. And so it took you a little (laughs) bit to get to culinary school. What was the moment where you were like, I don't want to do this. I love baking. You'll love it. It was like on the eve of graduating from college. I had an agreement with my parents, their first generation college goers, they, you know, scrimped and saved to ensure that we had the ability to go to college. And their only agreement was you go to college and you get good grades and you get a college degree from there. You can do whatever you want to do for a living. We'll support you. And on the eve of my college graduation, I was like, wait a second, (laughs) Am I really going to be an actuary for the rest of my life? Or am I going to, you know, how is this math thing going to play out for me? And I had a freak out moment. I loved math, but I loved the idea of like sitting in a corner doing math problems on a, you know, piece of paper, not necessarily putting it into action every day. And so I just had that momentary like real talk with myself, like, okay, well, you're going to have to do something every day for the rest of your life for a living. What's it going to be, my friend? All roads led to dessert. Christina grew up in a family where the oven was always warm and sweet treats crowded the countertops. First things first, both of my parents have like raging sweet teeth. I know what each of their favorite dessert is. If you pass by like an ice cream shop, the easiest thing to do is to like lobby dad. And if you wanted anything to come out of the oven in the form of dessert, you lobbied mom. Both my parents were working parents, so I was raised by my entire family, but my grandmas played a really big role in my upbringing and they both loved to bake. And so a lot of my child rearing years just happened in the kitchen because my grandmas were like, all right, come on, tag along. Yeah. So the idea of eating like a little knob of oatmeal cookie dough is like one of my first like food memories from childhood and knowing the smell of a batch of brownies out of the oven is something I'm very familiar with in an early age. And then beyond that, my parents... They, they let us do our thing. I think they both celebrated us as individuals, but they let us sort of march to the beat of our own drums. There was a lot of an emphasis on just sort of like these bright, loud, joyful moments in an otherwise just like suburban upbringing. And I think that's a really big part of why I am the way I am and why I choose to see the world the way that I do. So Christina went to culinary school and worked in fine dining until she decided that fancy cooking wasn't her style. So she ended up somewhere between math and food, 
In 2005, David Chang hired her at Momofuku to write his food safety plans and help communicate with the New York City Department of Health. But the girl loves to bake, so she would often bake for the Momofuku staff, bringing in treats from home, and David Chang loved her desserts. And they didn't sell any at the time, so he made her pastry chef and eventually encouraged her to open Milk Bar. One of the things you're famous for is the big tall cake that's not frosted on the sides. The youngsters, they don't even remember that wasn't a thing because on Instagram, there's just naked cakes everywhere. What's the origin story? Why did you decide to do that style of frosting or not frosting? Uh, It's such a good question. You know, when I went to open Milk Bar in November of 2008, I knew that I wanted to challenge the rules. I knew that what we didn't need was another awesome bakery that looked like other awesome bakeries, that we needed an awesome bakery that looked at things a little different. And so I sort of just set out to challenge every rule. As I looked at cake, I really thought to myself, we are trained as Americans to think about cake existing for every celebration. We celebrate through cake. But when you look at cake or when you looked at cake back then, you know, it was oftentimes not more than a sponge and some frosting on top. I mean, nothing wrong with that. I'm not mad at that. But I just looked at it and thought it could be so much more than that, right? Like we bring it to all of these special big and little moments in life that we want to commemorate. Just thought to myself, not only should we challenge what the outside of the cake looks like, but we should challenge what the cake is. And once I started building the layers of cake and frostings and fillings and crumbs and crunches, I just looked at it from the outside and thought, it is so wonderfully marvelous to get a peek into this cake. Why would we hide that with frosting? And I want to be really clear, I could take down a tub of frosting quicker than anyone else or than most people. Dare I say, I do it for a living, but... I just thought, like, let people in. That's that's kind of the purpose of cake from my perspective. So we don't frost the sides of the cake with frosting. We let them live out loud, loud and proud. You know what they're all about. You know what you're getting into. That's the most fun part of eating, right? Like the approach where you're looking at something and you go, you start, your eyes start to feed you before you actually get to dig in. When we come back, Christina describes the cake her husband designed for their wedding. Something so special, he made her vow she would never make a cake like that for anyone else ever again. And we'll dig into the history of the birthday cake. We'll be right back. I read that you had a summer camp themed wedding, which sounds like the most fun ever. I've been to one of those and it is so much better than any other wedding. Um, I'm curious what was on the menu. And of course, what were the desserts? Did you have a traditional wedding cake? You have to, you have to love it. So we had everything from like sack lunches to a sweet little buffet, s'mores, of course, right? Like all of the camp moves. My husband got our friends um, from Shake Shack to bring a whole Shake Shack course oh. to this campaign wedding, which is like best burger ever. And then he also surprised me and rented this ice cream truck and turned it into a milk bar ice cream truck for the night wow. and had my team like surprised me with all that stuff, which was just sort of like really fun. Like you're never too old to be a kid, even at your wedding. That's when, you know, you've met your match, but our wedding cake, hilariously enough, I was like, I don't feel like I'm equipped to decide on a wedding cake because I enjoy making wedding cakes for other people. And so I let him have his groomzilla moment, I call it. And I said, what do you want as a wedding cake? And he said, I want a mint cookies and cream cake because it'll be zesty and minty and not only be delicious, but feel very sort of outdoorsy and it's color theme. And he said, what's the tallest wedding cake you make at Milk Bar? So we make a six-tier wedding cake. He says, I want a seven-tier wedding cake. And you have to promise to never make anyone a seven tier wedding cake. Like I want my wedding cake to be the tallest wedding cake in milk bar history. So, so far I've been able to hold true to that promise. That's so cute. I hope it was in the vows. Seven tiers. I know seven tiers. Well, we did vow one of our vows that he promised to me was that we could go to Dairy Queen whenever I asked. (gasps) 
what's your favorite thing at Dairy Queen? Because I just huh. only like two years ago discovered the peanut buster parfait, and that's my that's so good. That's my favorite. Girl, get out of here. Okay, so I do a blizzard. I do it with um, Reese's Pieces, two times Reese's peanut butter cups, because I like the way that blends in, Oreos. And then if it is a grill and chill, I get a side of French fries that sometimes I dip into my blizzard. Mm-hmm. How many birthday cakes have you eaten in your life? If you're lucky, one for every year you've spent on this earth, plus all the cakes you've eaten for other people's birthdays. But have you ever wondered why cake became the celebration food? In an alternate universe, we could all be celebrating with birthday watermelons or birthday lasagnas, which honestly is not a bad idea. And why do we light birthday candles? I had never thought about any of these things before. They're so baked into our culture, I just never gave them a second thought. But after talking to Christina, I couldn't stop thinking about these questions. So I called an expert in Oxford, England. Uh, My name is Elisa Levine. Oh, hang on a minute. The book's called something else in the American edition. In America, it's called Cake, A Slice of History. But in the UK, they went for a slightly more whimsical version. And it's called Cake, The Short Surprising History of Our Favorite Bakes. Before we get to birthday cakes, we need to talk about birthdays. Elisa says it wasn't common for regular people to celebrate their birthdays before around the 18th century. An Egyptian pharaoh or President George Washington would have a birthday celebration, but birthdays were reserved for high-class, powerful people. According to The Atlantic, middle-class Americans didn't celebrate birthdays until around 1860 or 1880. And it wasn't until the 20th century that it became a nationwide tradition. And one of the biggest reasons is super basic. We didn't have reliable timekeeping. A lot of people just didn't actually know exactly when their birthday was or exactly what their age was. But also this sense of being special, of sort of celebrating yourself, and especially for children, celebrating their special day, didn't really come about until we started to think about childhood as being a time when young people deserve to have um, a really special day made for them. And that, again, depended on quite a lot of things, the lowering of mortality rates amongst children, um, spare money that could be spent on celebrating children, and an enormous rise in consumerism. The Atlantic speculates that when families got smaller, when people on average only had a couple of kids, parents began to celebrate them. Children started to be seen in a more emotional light instead of just this crew of little laborers who could help you around the farm. But there was actually some resistance to celebrating birthdays. The Atlantic says, quote, birthday party poopers thought that the celebrations were self-centered and materialistic, took attention away from God and turned children into brats, unquote. I mean, it's not untrue. Even I demanded, demanded a giant expensive cake for my 40th birthday. And you can see a photo of that cake and a link to which bakery I got it from on my Instagram. Hello, Rachel Bell. Okay, so now that we've covered birthdays, we can talk about birthday cakes. When did people start celebrating with a birthday cake? Well, cakes have been being used to celebrate things for a very long time. So weddings, for example, we have recipes for great cakes and even things called wedding cakes back into the medieval period. And even much earlier, the ancient Greeks and Romans had cakes that they would use to celebrate special achievements. They made cheesecakes for athletes, for example, to, to send them into their sports uh, enriched with with cheese because it was thought to be good for strength. But I don't think we can really start to see it being connected to birthdays until, again, around about the 18th century. Elisa says ancient cakes were much different than the light, fluffy sponges with frosting that we know today. They were dense, flat, studded with fruit, and usually not sweetened with sugar. And about what time in history did it transform into the cake that we know today? I think that transformation really couldn't have taken place until the 18th century. And that's because there were a few things that came together at that time to make it possible. So firstly, technology, that people didn't have accurate ovens and certainly unlikely to have them in their own houses before then. They'd be much more likely baking using a fire or something. Secondly, a lot of the ingredients weren't quite ready to become the cake that we know today. So flour was a lot heavier and coarser. Sugar was very expensive, and so people didn't have access to it. Um, And strangely, people didn't really seem to have realized that if you whip eggs for a long time, it makes them very light. But when all those things coalesced, the raising power of the eggs and then later on artificial raising ingredients as well, all started to transform the cake. 
And then at the same time, there's also an increasing shift to a sense that something that's light and white is more refined and more expensive and therefore more desirable. And so people started to want make, to make cakes that looked like that. Nashville's Ann Byrne has sold millions of cookbooks, most of them about cake. Her book, American Cake, is an excellent, well-researched book about the history of cake in America. How did cakes come to represent celebration? Well, I think cake has always been different. It's been held a little bit higher. It's been celebratory because it required sugar. It required an oven. And to eat a slice of cake, you needed a fork. America was rural and it was poor. You have to think that, you know, the amount of sugar that was used in cakes and certainly the kind of heavily frosted cakes that we think of as the American layer cake weren't available to everyone. And so maybe baking a cake was a precious occasion. And certainly during war years and people with rationing, you know, neighbors would squirrel away enough, you know, sugar to bake a cake. So I think cake has really earned the right to be special. And a cake is designed to be sliced and shared by a large group of people as opposed to a cookie or a piece of candy, which could be eaten alone. Where did the tradition of putting birthday candles on a cake come from? Well, this was apparently also a German tradition, um, but it wasn't necessarily the celebratory function that we have today. It's often thought that the candles were actually supposed to be about warding off evil spirits and that the way that the smoke and the light travels upwards was something about keeping the soul safe and making a connection with heaven. Um, we know that candles have been put on cakes for a long time, and that is thought to have been connected to the fact that the cake was often baked in a round shape to evoke uh, the shape of the moon, and that the candles were on there as another way to honour the goddess of the moon by the Greeks and the Romans. So probably in the medieval period is when it started to be connected with birthdays, but again bound up with these ideas about religion and magic and superstition uh, in ways that we don't really think about today. Those early German birthday candles weren't blown out. They let them slowly burn down to their ends. You wouldn't want to extinguish the flame because it would equate to extinguishing the life. And so letting it burn was a way of wishing well for the child's future that they would survive to their next year. And it's been suggested that that might be why in some families you have uh, candles that number your new age, but also another one to grow on um, to see you through to the next year. And I guess that all links in with that same idea that you you are wishing for time to pass successfully and happily. You don't want to extinguish it early by blowing it out. Anne says the first cakes in America came over with the European colonists. British fruitcake. Uh, you had pound cakes that were British in origin and and there were early cheesecakes actually that the Quakers were baking. But when I think of the one American cake, I think it's got to be gingerbread. It just sort of speaks to hard scrabble America starting up. The spices were cleverly used to mask the flavor, the bitter flavor of the leavening, those crude early leavening agents that were used called potash and later pearl ash. And they were made by from hardwood tree ash from burning trees, clearing land in the Hudson River Valley. So all of the cakes that you mentioned as being the first ones seem to come from Europe and kind of took on their own variations. Is there a cake that is the first that is truly American that was developed here? Or because we're such a melting pot, does everything have its roots in a cake from somewhere oh. else? Oh, that's a great question. Rose Levy Berenbaum told me that, that she said, you know, the most American cake is the chiffon. Because it was the one, that was the one cake that was invented in this country. And I do think a lot of our cakes have morphed from Europe and we have transformed European cakes into our own. Even gingerbread has English and, and German roots. But the chiffon cake was born, yeah, in the 1920s in California in Beverly Hills, where, you know, a pastry chef goes west to find his fortune and uh, bakes cakes for the stars. And that's when he started using the secret ingredient in cakes, which was vegetable oil. And General Mills, actually, General Foods actually, uh, bought his formula from him for the chiffon cake, and he became an instant millionaire. So when they bought his recipe, does that mean they turned it into a cake mix or they just bought it so that they could put it on the side of their flour? Exactly. Okay. The latter, General Foods made a vegetable oil and wanted to market it. And so that made the perfect combination. In her book, she also credits enslaved cooks and bakers with introducing ingredients like coconut and sweet potatoes to American desserts, which is how we got coconut cakes and sweet potato pie. Anne also may have the answer to the most divisive of dessert debates. Team cake versus team pie. 
The Pennsylvania Dutch, who are credited with introducing all kinds of desserts to America, had really strong opinions on the topic. They did believe that there was sort of class system. And there were those who baked and ate pies and those who baked and ate cake. And the cake bakers and eaters were a a little bit upper crust. The fact that they could afford forks and would not eat with their hands. They thought of pie as something you would make in the morning. You'd take out in your lunch uh, with you, you know, to work in the fields. It was a very portable food, whereas cake was celebratory. You know, you, you sliced it and you ate a slice on a plate and you ate it with a fork. So I think cakes probably were a way to differentiate class and wealth, and I'm sure race, in America. I have never understood this debate. Why do we need to choose between cake and pie? There is no reason to spend all this time fighting when you could just be eating both. I like cake. I like pie. One time I made one of those pie cake and that wasn't good. So keep your cake and your pie separate, but eat both. And no fighting. When we come back, Christina reveals her last meal. And we do a lightning round where she fires off all of her favorite sweets. We'll be right back. I made you wait for it. We had a lot of cake to discuss, but it is time to talk about Christina Tosi's last meal. My last meal, I would take, I think, a little page out of my playbook as a teenager, which is to say I would sort of push all of the savory things, options to the side. And I think I would just go like Marie Antoinette style. Give me a long table of all the desserts. But in my last meal vision, that long table would have things like sleeves of Oreos and cold glasses of milk ready to dunk or like warm chocolate chip cookies fresh out of the oven or like a soft serve machine that I could just, that would pull limitless swirls of cereal milk ice cream or birthday ice cream or what have you. But for me, it's more about choosing dessert as the course over like the meal part of the meal that most people think. And then more about the abundance of dessert. Like in my imagination, my last meal also means that I have like a bottomless pit of a stomach because every dessert I would want a taste of before I had to say goodbye for good. (laughs) So do you have this thought every day? Are you like, "Mm, I have to eat my dinner and I just want my dessert. Do you still have that sweet tooth? I'm a little bit better about it. I still have like memories of being like a 16, 17, 18 year old. My mom being like, Christina, you're going to have to figure out how to eat real meals before you don't go into dessert. Otherwise, like who's going to bring you out on a date or like, are you just going to sit on your hands through like every Thanksgiving meal waiting for dessert to be served? Like you're going to have to figure it out. And so I do a little bit, but like last night was the perfect example. I looked at my husband and I was like, what do you want for dinner? And he looked at me and was like, ice cream. And I was like, I love it. Once a week, you know what I mean? Secret to life is having a partner who knows you well enough and is happy to be like, you just want ice cream for dinner tonight. Don't you, you know, one night a week, something where you're just like, you want to know why you break the rules. It's your life. You're living it on your terms. But I, I really love savory food as well, but, um, I would give most savory food up for a dessert tableau. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, your mom was like, you're going to have to figure this out. And you did because, A, you made a stuffing ice cream. So that's what's up for Thanksgiving. And B, it reminds me of, you know, I got in trouble always when I was a kid for talking too much in class. And I want to go back and find all these teachers and be like, guess what I do for a living now? I talk. And look what you do for a living. You eat dessert. That's it, girl. I just tell you, we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> Gaming life and all of its glory. For her last meal, Christina wants a never-ending tableau of desserts and never-ending stomach capacity. She wants sleeves of Oreo cookies with ice-cold milk, warm chocolate chip cookies, and Milk Bar's cereal milk ice cream. Is there a dessert that you don't love, like something you can say no thank you to? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not really into desserts with booze in them. Mm -hmm. Like, I like the separation of the two. I don't want my booze with my dessert. If I want to drink, I want to drink. If I want dessert, I want dessert. And I'm not a fan of super, um, 
I like my cakes American, an American style cake. So a sponge that is quite like rich in butter and oil and very sort of bouncy and moist where I went to culinary school before I started working my way up in the industry. And the idea of like a classic French sponge or gateau, I love that there's no leavener in it beyond the air that you're like, I love the technique of it. I think it's such a brilliant, marvelous thing, but it doesn't land in my heart from a flavor standpoint. I'd say those are my two. They're not even dessert pet peeves. They're just things that like, I can appreciate them for what they are and where they came from, but they're just not my thing. I do think that Christina is my long lost taste bud sister. I also don't like desserts that have booze in them. And now the Christina Tosi dessert speed round. What is your ideal and perfect birthday cake? My ideal and perfect birthday cake, believe it or not, is the box funfetti cake mix cake with the tub of frosting that has sprinkles folded in. And it's purely nostalgic for me. That is actually Greta Gerwig's last meal as well. Is that real? Mm-hmm. It is. I mean, it's, it's the reason the Milk Bar birthday cake exists, right? Like we figured out how to reverse engineer it to make it from scratch and not coated in frosting. But for me, it's that it's a sheet cake of that. Nothing can top it for birthday. That's how I know it's my birthday. What's your favorite cookie? Um, it is actually not a fully baked cookie. It is fresh chocolate chip cookie dough that I put into a yellow teacup and I put in the microwave for like, it depends on the microwave, five to seven, eight seconds. So it's like warm and gooey in the center, but never actually bakes all the way through. Whoa, I have to try that. So it's not quite like the mug cake thing, but just like a little warm. No, 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 no. Yeah. It is like if you took your chocolate chip cookie sheet tray out of the oven, like a minute or two in, it's that state. Um, Uh, What's your favorite ice cream flavor? My favorite ice cream flavor is either peanut butter cup or mint cookies and cream. You can see exactly who I am as a person. (laughs) It depends on my mood. Am I feeling like zesty and like vanilla frosting notes or am I just all peanut butter all day long? And what's your favorite cereal? These days I've been mixing my cereal. So I usually do a mixture of honey bunches of oats and golden grams. Or I mix honey bunches of oats and this new Little Debbie cereal that's their oatmeal cream pie that comes in little O's. It's a run, don't walk situation. Do you guys have grocery outlet on the East Coast? Do you know about gross out? No, but okay. I definitely need to know more. You would love to know. It's this discount grocery store and they often sell products that like didn't do well and they're off the shelves and they always have funky wild cereals and that Little Debbie, I'm like, that like, sounds like something you find at gross out. Like all of these, 100%. and they have like all the holiday cereals that they couldn't sell in the store. Next time you're in Seattle, actually, you'd crack the canvases up to be like, I'd like to go to Grocery Outlet, please. Uh-huh. It's on my list. I'm adding it right now. And that was Christina Tosi's last meal. A little bit of context to the end of our conversation. Christina and her husband live in New York City, but they are very close friends with Brian and Mark Canlis, the hilarious brothers who own Seattle's Canlis restaurant. Mark and Brian were guests on Your Last Meal over the summer, which you probably remember because I got a lot of messages, maybe the most messages I've ever gotten about an episode about how much you love them. So if you haven't listened to the Mark and Brian Canlis episode, check it out. And then go to MilkBarStore.com to find a Milk Bar location or to order some of Christina's treats. They ship everything on the menu right to your door, including the three-tier birthday layer cakes. And it is not too late to order the apple cider donut cake or the pumpkin Milk Bar pie for Thanksgiving. Christina also has a new children's book called Every Cake Has a Story. Find it wherever books are sold. But as usual, I have to tell you, buy it at your local independent bookstore. Thank you so much, Christina. You're such a joy. I could chat with you all day, but you got to go because you probably have 35 more interviews. Uh, You're the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. It was really fun chatting. Yes. Thanks, Rach. Bye. Bye. Thanks to Elisa Levine, author of Cake, A Slice of History. Do you have any birthday cake traditions in your family? We do. We have one traditional recipe that we all use, my mother and and my sister's, and we call it Queenie's Chocolate Cake. It's named after my great aunt who was nicknamed Queenie, and it's actually a very simple chocolate cake, but it's very moist. And the secret is that it has a couple of tablespoons of hot water added to the batter, and it's super reliable, which is really what you want when you're baking for other people. 
so we all make it for all of our children. Thanks to Anne Byrne, who is about to release her 15th book. It is called A New Take on Cake. I also really, really recommend one of her other books, American Cake. I loved reading about the history and seeing recipes for all of these old school American cakes, including some presidential favorites. George Washington, the Martha Washington Great Cake, Thomas Jefferson, Biscuit de Savoie, uh, which was an orange sponge cake. I love that. Uh, James Madison, Dolly Madison Seed Cake. That's a famous cake, which was like a pound cake. Andrew Jackson, Blackberry Jam Cake. Very Kentucky, very Tennessee. Chester Arthur Devil's Food Cake. Grover Cleveland, White Cake with White Frosting. Theodore Roosevelt Clove Cake, Richard Nixon Baked Alaska, Jimmy Carter Lane Cake, Bill Clinton Carrot Cake. I've never even heard of Chester Arthur, so there's a little education about who our president (laughs) is, too. (laughs) This episode was produced by Laura Scott and me, theme music by Prom Queen. It's the birthday cake episode, so if today is your birthday, happy birthday! Make sure you're following along on Instagram. I'm Hello Rachel Bell, B E L L E. We just had a very fun discussion about birthday cakes in my feed. So if you want to go see what other listeners love for their birthday cake, check out Hello Rachel Bell. A birthday gift for me, my birthday's two months away. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if that's how you're listening. And if you're listening on an app that lets you rate us, give us the whole big five stars. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is your last meal. Which makes sense considering her original career trajectory. Considering her original career tra- tra- trajectory. Tra- oh my God, that word is so hard to say.